Okay, so let's get into my most favorite group, which are going to be the dinosaurs. So dinosaurs, as we saw, are descendants of those thecodonts, right, which we just took a look at right, in class um, on Friday. Uh, but we can break dinosaurs down into two groups. Um, first of all, our dinosaurs appear in the late Triassic, right? So they don't appear um, for quite a while. So they don't appear for quite a while. Uh, like I said, not until the late Triassic, because we're coming out of that huge Permian extinction, which, you know, wiped out a significant portion of life. So it's going to take life quite a while to rebound. Our first dinosaurs were pretty small, uh, definitely more like a chicken size. Um, but by the time we get to the end of the Triassic, they're just definitely more sizable. But we can break our dinosaurs down into two groups. Uh, we have the Sauritians and the Ornithitians, and the way we break them down is looking at the hip structure. So if we take a look, um, all hips have three bones, right, on each side, yours does too. The top bone is called the ilium, this is the part you can feel, right, if you can feel your hip bone, you're feeling your ilium. Uh, then you have the ischium and the pubis. Now the difference between the Sauritians and the Ornithitians lie in the ischium and the pubis. So if we take a look at Sauritians, I want you to notice that the pubis points forwards, right, and the ischium points to the back. Okay, so here on good old T-Rex, we've got a forward-facing pubis. However, if we look at ornithitians, you see that the pubis is rotated backwards, right? It's rotated in the same direction as the ischium. Okay, so here we take a look at this guy here, right? pointed to the back. So that's going to be your anatomical difference that you're going to be able to use to tell these two groups of dinosaurs apart. Now Sauritians are called lizard-hipped uh, because modern lizards have this hip structure and ornithitians are called bird-hipped because modern birds have this structure. Now this is where this can get a little bit confusing. So dinosaurs were named long before we had any idea that birds actually evolved from dinosaurs. Um, so Right, the paleontologist did the right thing by saying, okay, bird hit, all right, good, modern birds, there's the correlation. However, as it turns out, birds evolve from Saurischian dinosaurs. So don't let that confuse you, right? Even though ornithitians are bird hit, birds don't evolve from them. Birds evolve from the Saurischian dinosaurs. So just be sure to make that note. Now, one interesting, couple interesting things about dinosaurs before we get into the different groups that we can see in the Triassic, which aren't many, um, is first have dinosaurs chew up their food. Um, so dinosaurs have what's called homodont dentition. So homodont dentition means they have the same type of tooth all the way around their mouth, which means they have no molars. They can't chew up their food the way we do. So what they do is they swallow these things called gastroliths. Uh, gastroliths are stomach stones, and they sit in the stomach, and as the dinosaur is digesting its food, the, the stones help grind it up, just like molars do. And I know that sounds really strange, right? Why would a dinosaur swallow rocks, right, to have them in their stomach to do that? Well, what's even more interesting it is birds, alligators, and crocodiles all do this today. So we see modern animals doing this. So this type of behavior is not out of the realm of possibility. Plus we find gastrolus associated with dinosaur skeletons. Uh, if you notice, there's acid pits right on these rocks, right? And of course we find them associated with the skeleton. Another thing we could clear up is, are dinosaurs warm-blooded or cold-blooded? And of course, this debate still rages on. Um, usually, we tend to put animals in two categories, because that's what we see today, warm-blooded, cold-blooded. However, there's actually a wide array of uh, different types of blood, I guess, if you want to say it. Um, so we don't have just warm-blooded and cold-blooded. There's a whole bunch of shades in between. And as we see, this is probably where most dinosaurs are lying. Um, but if you want to go with right, these two arguments, a lot of people argue that they're cold-blooded because they're reptiles. There's definitely some things that say, well, some of these dinosaurs might be warm-blooded or working towards warm-blooded. Um, for example, we can look at structures in the bone that are similar, right? the way the dinosaurs move are similar. Um, However, if we take a look at our really big dinosaurs, right, these are the guys that I study, um, what they're probably doing is something similar to what we see in the giant leather sea, uh, leatherback sea turtle. 
Below the back sea turtle is a big turtle, uh, 68 feet long, 1,200 to 1,500 pounds. And most turtles live in a tropical region. However, this turtle lives in the Arctic Circle. So how the heck could a reptile live in the top Arctic Circle? Well, what it's done is it's increased its surface area. So it has more surface area to mass so it can retain the sunlight better, right? Retain that heat it's collecting from the sun. And this is probably what some of our bigger dinosaurs are doing, right? Same kind of thing. They're increasing their surface area so they're able to retain heat better. But in reality, what most of these dinosaurs are doing is something in between. It's not straight warm-blooded, not straight cold-blooded. There's a whole variety of other options, but that's probably where they are. All right, so in the Triassic, um, some of the early dinosaurs we see to evolve are prosauropods. So first, to orient you to the skeleton, okay, here we've got the eye socket outlining that there. Um, here we have the nose, right? There's the nasal cavity. Uh, down here, this is a sinus cavity, okay? So like, like the sinus you have right in your face or up there in your forehead. And then if you notice all the way in the back, we have the diaspid condition. Remember that upper hole and the lower hole. And, and, and most dinosaurs, they're, they're, they're joined together right for one big hole. So just so you kind of get a look at, kind of get an idea of what you're looking at here because you're going to see lots of skulls and skeletons from this point out. But prosauropods were a very early group of herbivorous dinosaurs. Um, they really only lived through the late Triassic and into the Jurassic. Um, they're pretty small. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're fairly long, but in general, they're very gracile type animals. They have a very bizarre posture, um, these really big thumb claws. Let's, let's take a look at some of these so you can kind of get an idea. So the first one is uh, Platyosaurus. Uh, Platyosaurus is from the late Triassic of Europe. Um, it has five fingers, which is definitely an ancestral condition. But if you take a look, right, first of all, you can see, right, Look at there's that forward facing pubis. Okay, so it gives you a good idea there, right, of, of what you're looking for to identify the dinosaurs. But if you take a look, this dinosaur really doesn't look right as a quadrupedal and it doesn't look right as bipedal. So this dinosaur is definitely uh, using both. It's probably walking around bipedal, but it can easily go down to all fours to eat, right, or use its limbs to do something like that as well. But you can see it's definitely a, a fairly sizable, sizable dinosaur. Then we have everybody's favorite, Musasaurus. Musasaurus means mouse lizard um, because it's really tiny. So if we take a look here um, at the skeleton, so the whole skeleton here is fitting in this guy's hand. So here is the head right here, and the eye is here, so it's looking backwards. Here's the neck, there's the arms, there's the torso with all the ribs, and here's the legs, right, all folded up. Let me erase this so that way you can actually see the skeleton there. Um, but Musasaurus is interesting because we find lots of these little guys. Um, like I said, they're really tiny. And what these really are are babies. Um, as a animal goes from being a baby to being a grown-up, there's a lot of changes that happen to the skeleton. We call this ontogeny. Um, sometimes it's virtually impossible um, if you were given just a baby skeleton and an adult skeleton to know that they're related, if you, if you had no idea, because they look really different. Um, there's an immense amount of changes that happen. Just look at, you know, your little brother or your little sister and how much they change, right, from the day that they're born all the way through to they're an adult. There's a lot of changes that happen to the skeleton. Um, so musasaurus are, are a collection of babies, and until we find an adult associated with the skeleton, we're not really going to know who it belongs to. All right, some of our theropods that we see at this time. Theropods are our meat eaters. These are primarily our, car our uh, carnivores. Um, their characteristics are they have three toes, okay, so that's a derived condition. They have a furcula, which is a wishbone. If you've ever pulled apart the wishbone on Thanksgiving, you're pulling apart the furcula. So the furcula uh, obviously doesn't facilitate flight or help facilitate flight in theropods, um, and, but in birds it does. It's kind of this extra brace, right, that's used uh, for all those muscle attachments. Uh, it has air-filled bones. What we see is a lot of these theropods have a very hollow bone. So instead of having dense bones like what we have, it's much more open and hollow. And in birds, that definitely helps them attain flight, right? In birds, uh, we actually see the lungs invade into the bones, and that's what helps them fly. Theropods aren't quite doing that. They have a lot of open space and a lot of... Um, 
air sac space, closed off space in their bones. And I'm not even going to say some anymore. Let's let's erase this. I need to I need to update. They all had feathers. Um, as we're learning, pretty much all dinosaurs had feathers. It doesn't mean that they were covered in feathers, but it definitely means that they're going to have feathers somewhere on their body uh, for sure. So, uh, one of these early theropods we can see is Coelophysis. Its name means hollow form, and that's just talking about its bones there. Um, it's small and carnivorous. We find it from North America. Um, it's, you know, anywhere from six to nine feet long, um, less than a meter tall at the tips. So when we talk about how tall a dinosaur is, we're going to talk about it from the hips, um, because at the hips, we're not going to argue how tall it is. This neck position, we might argue all day long, right, as paleontologists. However, right, we know how long, how tall the leg is. So we're, we're always going to go there from the hips. Um, we find tons of these skeletons out in New Mexico uh, at the specific site. It's a mass death uh, site. Basically what happened is you have this pack out there and um, a big giant flood came by and just kind of buried and killed a whole bunch of these animals. But what's neat when we find that is it's telling us a little bit more about the animal. Skeletons are really cool, uh, but when we find them all in a a whole bunch of them together that's telling us a little bit about that that animal's sociability right it's telling us that the animal is a pack hunter it didn't hunt alone right it was stayed in groups sometimes when we take a look at these packs we find babies in the middle and adults on the outside so right that tells us a lot about a lot more about the animal than just the skeleton um, if we take a look at, at this skeleton down here, I, I want to raise your attention to it because you're going to start to see lots of skeletons like this. So if you notice here, the head is upside down, right? There's there's the eye. Um, this doesn't mean that the animal could literally look at its own butt, right, when it wanted to. This is a product of rigor mortis. So a lot of these muscles um, that move the neck are going to attach back here uh, on, on top of the, the vertebra. And when rigor mortis sets in as the animal dies, right, those muscles and tendons and ligaments all tense up, right, or relax in some cases, and it's going to cause this, this type of, of curvature in the neck. So I don't want you to think that's something the animal could do in real life. We start to see a little bit of um, early flight at this point in time. Um, our earliest flyers were definitely gliders. Um, we, my favorite really of all time is this guy down here. So bizarre. Uh, this is Longisquama. Longisquama here, as you can see, if you, if you kind of take away these big tall scales that are sitting up there, it looks like a pretty typical lizard, typical reptile there. Uh, but it has these really long ornate scales. These are not feathers. They are long scales that are coming out there. Um, and it's using it to, to kind of catch the air, right? So if you've ever seen um, one of those seed pods that comes off a tree that looks like a whirly gig, right? And it kind of spirals down. And that's kind of what Longisquam is doing, right? So it could fan it open or close it up, right, to catch that wind. Um, so feathers, as we're going to talk more about, I'm going to mention it um, in the videos, but we're going to talk more about it in class. Um, feathers definitely evolve from scales. Um, they're, they're similar structures. Uh, your hair, your fingernails... Um, feathers, all of that comes, all of that's derived from a type of keratin, and uh, we'll talk about that evolution in class. Other um, gliders that might be a little bit more active in their flight are like Charopteryx that we have here, which you can see it's got this little right wind foil essentially that's happening back here. Um, so it could probably move its arms up and down, flap a little bit, but it's definitely still catching the air. All right, so here's a good place to stop, and we'll catch up with the next video.